Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ken. I'm here with Lingso, and we're back to our weekly uh, virtual classes. And today we have a very exciting class from the Master Gardeners um, by Aridi here. And she's going to be talking about keep your garden humming. As always, this class is being recorded, and I'll go ahead and email a recorded link as well as a PDF copy of the presentation towards the end of the day or by tomorrow. So look forward to that. And you can also find the recorded classes on Linkso's website under the community resources page. And without further ado, Naridi, the floor is all yours. So welcome. All right, welcome everybody. Um, today I'm here talking about one of my favorite subjects. And um, I hope at the end of the presentation, it becomes one of your favorite subjects. So um, before I begin, though, I'd like to talk about who are the UCCE Master Gardeners. So we are a statewide program that is operated on a county to county basis. And we operate under the umbrella of the University of California. And we are trained by UC specialists who are involved in current research and education in their area of expertise. So as trained volunteers, which I am, I've been a master gardener since 2014, and representatives of UC, we provide UC research-based gardening information to the residents of our counties, whether they are home gardeners, such as many of you might be, or members of community organizations. So today specifically, we have, there are many pollinators, but I'm going to be talking about favorite pollinators in terms of these are the pollinators that do the most work for pollination in the garden. And these are bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Now, other pollinators um, that we have are wasps, beetles, bats. In fact, in the San Francisco Botanical Garden, there is a magnolia, a species of magnolia tree that can only be pollinated by bats, um, moths, and also the wind and water are act as pollinators. And that is they spread pollen from flower to flower. So before we talk about what is it to define pollination and why is it critical, I wanted to ask all of you to close your eyes for about 30 seconds and take a deep breath in and release it slowly. And now try to imagine in your mind's eye a world without flowers. Try to imagine a cup without coffee. And try to imagine a salad or bruschetta without tomatoes. And now you can open your eyes. And this is why pollination is so critical because it provides 75%, it results in fertilization providing 75% of our flowering plants and one third of rural crops depend upon it. And those three substances, uh, three vegetables I just mentioned all depend upon it. And so do our apples and the list just goes on and on. So what is pollination? Pollination is a process that transfers the pollen from the male anthers of the flower to the stigma or the female organ of um, a species related flower. And that causes our um, plants to fruit, to multiply. And I just love this photo here of the bee on the flower, very actively engaged, probably in the process of pollination.
So bees are really the stars, and that's why I'm talking about them first. Over 1,500 um, species in California, we have over 1,500 species of bees. In the US, we have 4,000 native bees in the US. Um, but as you can see, over one quarter of these are found in California. So, um, evolve with our plants and therefore emerge at the same time as their favorite plants. And interestingly enough, only the female bees sting. And um, they're primarily interested in three things, pollen, nectar, and mating. So we have over 100 crops in the US, dropping down to the second bullet point here, that are bee pollinated. And bees deliberately collect pollen as food for their larvae. Here is a um, picture of the Western or European honeybee, also known as Apis mellifera. And worldwide, this is the most common honeybee. And before the Europeans arrived, this honeybee originated in Europe. There were no honeybees in the US. Just an interesting factoid. So there's one species of honeybee worldwide and they are basically, their season is year round. They are colony and the casts are queen, worker and drone. And they nest in large cavities in trees, ground buildings or hive boxes. In fact, um, the, their preferred flowers are broad nectar and pollen generalists. And they say if you have one tip is that if you have a, um, for many bees, if you have a dead limb on your tree and it's not posing a safety risk to yourself or to others to leave it in place um, because some of our bees like the carpenter, mason, and leaf cutter um, actually um, will nest in the ground, but there are other bees that want to nest in, um, in the trees, in, the, in wood, like the carpenter bees. The reason they're called carpenter bees is they nest in wood. What do honeybees pollinate? They pollinate vegetables, there's a whole list of vegetables here, beet, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. The list goes on, cucumber, eggplant, okra, squash. They pollinate fruits, apples, apricots, berries, cherry, citrus, melons, pear, plum, tomato, and watermelon. And they pollinate our nuts and our seeds like almonds, walnuts, hazelnuts, macadamia, and sunflower. And here is a bumblebee. It's a little bit fatter and broader um, than the other bees. And there are 26 species of bumblebees, another pollinator in um, our area, the Bay Area in California. Um, and by the way, for those of you who are Zooming in from um, other states other than California, this presentation is aimed primarily at California um, plants and insects, but when noted, um, I'll say in California and I'll mention the United States in general when applicable. All the bumblebees forage, and again, they have a colony of a queen worker and a drone, and they nest in tree cavities and burrows like old rodent burrows and old bird's nests. So another uh, use for that limb that may be uh, dead on your tree would be possibly to serve the bumblebees um, because they like spaces like that. Oh, by the way, I did wanna say that ANR, which is the UCCE Master Gardener Programs, uh, the University of California Agricultural and Natural Resources. They say about the bumblebee, 
that it is, they have a list called yellow stripy things. And on this, it says that the bumblebee is the bee that helps the most with pollination. Um, and actually that is the honeybee, but the bumblebee, pardon me, let, let me just back up. The honeybee helps the most with population, but the bumblebee also pollinates very, very well. But it's so fat that it shouldn't be able to fly, according to our resource page. And it will let you, now I don't advise this, but it says it will let you pet it without getting agitated. And they actually refer to it as a flying panda. So um, I haven't tried the petting experiment and you do so at your own risk, but this is what our experts say. So why should we care about pollinators? Well, one in three mouthfuls of our food uh, depend upon and require pollination. The benefits to the ecosystem, it keeps plant communities healthy and productive, and it's central to other wildlife from songbirds to grizzly bears. And how do we design a garden for bees? So a bee-friendly plant palette provides continuous bloom throughout the season because many of them live annually and reproduce throughout the season. A diversity of flower types supports a diversity of bees and plants that are native to California are recommended. And of course, whenever possible, plant those drought tolerant um, plants because we are officially in a drought in California. And so the more things we can do to help the environment, the better. Avoiding pesticides. If you go on any website, the USGS has a great website. I'll be listing resources at the end on pollinators. So does the um, US Forestry Service. If you go on any of these websites, one of the first things of like the first three points that we'll mention is avoiding pesticides. Um, and that is because whatever you put in the plant or spray on the plant or apply to the plant will be transferred to the pollinator and pesticides are actually one of the reasons that our pollinator population is declining and it's something that has many people, including myself and, and the agricultural community, um, very concerned that pesticides are uh, not good for pollinators. They don't mix. And oftentimes the pesticide you're applying doesn't only um, hit the intended target, but hits other plants and other things not intended. So one thing to really keep in mind, um, and if you m absolutely must use a pesticide, um, use the IPM integrated pest management principle of using the least toxic uh, material possible. But again, the recommendation is to avoid um, pesticides. Read labels carefully before purchasing as many pesticides are especially um, harm, dangerous for bees. And obviously use the product properly. And when you have to apply something, use it at night when the pollinators aren't active. And again, in this case, you might st start with an insecticidal soap first um, using the least uh, intense uh, method of, of eradicating whatever is plaguing your plant. Here are some plant families that bees absolutely love. Um, the Asteraceae family, which are daisies, asters, sunflowers, Erigerin glaucus, Echinacea, um, purpurea. 
Fabiaceae, which is the legume family. Um, Lamiaceae, the mint family, mint lavender, salvia, thyme, rosemary, and agastache. The buckwheat family, the rosaceae family with roses, apples, strawberries, and the papaveraceae family, the California poppy. Um, so easy to start from seed in the early spring, I just, sometimes I just go out in the back of my garden. I do have a, a pollinator garden myself and I go out in the back of the garden in very early spring and just spread broadcast seeds in a small, in an open area that I have. And also choosing the right flowers. Um, so the native plants are four times more attractive to bees than exotic flowers. Choose several colors of plants, blue, purple, yellows. Hummingbirds particularly like reds and oranges. Plant flowers together in clumps. So what do, we, do I mean by a clump? So rather than planting an individual uh, plant here and there, um, a flower clump would consist of at least three to five plants planted together. And why is that important in attracting pollinators? Well, it's important because, you know, a small mass or clump of plants, um, for instance, if you had zinnias, which are, are uh, attract pollinators. Planted together provide a really good landing strip, a landing pad. The, the insects, the bees, the butterflies, they can see them from the air and they're attracted by color. Pollinators are attracted by color, attracted by once they get closer or from the air. Let me do it from the, from the air first, buzzing overhead, attracted by color and they're attracted by different shapes. And they're also attracted by um, the large masses, but they are also attracted once they get closer by the scent of the plant. So all of those things help uh, to attract pollinators to your garden. Those different shapes I mentioned and Attempting to have a diversity of plants flowering all seasons. So that diversity in the seasons, a usual, a, a, a good sort of guideline of planting is you need to have um, the pollinators get active and every state is different. So you might wanna look up your state, but in California, they, get, they start coming in the early spring. So in the early spring, about 20% of your plants should be, pollinator plants should be blooming. In the summer, about 40%, and in the fall, 40%. And by winter, of course, uh, they're not as active. So I hope that acts as a good guideline um, for planting and rotating uh, your plants through the garden. This is a wonderful photo taken by a master gardener in my San Mateo, San Francisco master gardener program, Jeffrey Blake, and it's a bee on milkweed. And the reason I'm showing this is milkweed um, for the monarch butter butterfly, but for many, mostly the monarch, is a, a very critical host plant. There are some people that say no monarchs. I've heard Another master gardener say this, no, no milkweed, no monarchs, right? Because that's where they use, a host plant is where they lay their eggs, you know, to be able to go through um, the cycle and, and we'll get to that. So um, they must have milkweed. So this is a good example of, a, and there are many different milkweed species. A slepius is milkweed. This is uh, the variety of speciosa. And you can see the monarch landing on this milkweed. 
and it's also known um, in layman's terms, non-binomial terms as California showy. Uh, and this photo is compliments of Las Politas Nursery, which actually is a good resource um, for getting native plants. And I'll be mentioning more resources as we move along. And whenever you can, here's some California natives to work into your garden, rosy or red buckwheat, other uh, horticultural name, Oreogonum rubicens. Rubicens means rosy in Latin. Ceanothus, this happens to be the point Sierra variety, but there are many um, Ceanothuses and that is um, of Julia Phillips, Ray Hartman, Dark Star, Yankee Point, all of these work, but when in doubt, if you're looking up several different varieties, track the one that may do best in your area. And um, I was out at City College. I was taking a horticultural class there in the spring and they had a plot that was probably 10 feet long, it was on the grounds of City College by maybe six feet wide. And it was full of Ceanothus impressus. And it sounds just like impress, spelled just like impress with a U-S at the end. And it was swarming with bees. They were all over that plant. So um, also when you're out and about and you are seeing pollinators, whether in, you know, today just taking a walk around my neighborhood in San Francisco's Noe Valley. I saw a lot of sidewalk gardens and um, container plants. You can plant pollinator plants in container plantings. They don't always have to be in the ground to attract the pollinators. And it's amazing. So if you're, in one case, there were bumblebees on, um, they, she had a combination of, of cosmos and um, some flowering geraniums and some nandina in a container. And so as you see things as you go, whether you're visiting a friend's garden or you're in a park and you, you see the pollinators on the plants, that's a really good indicator that for your area, that plant works to attract these. Here's another native, um, Ericium capitatum, which is the wall, otherwise known as the wallflower plant. It comes in um, different colors. And you will see as we go along, and, and many of these pollinator plants do prefer sun. And that's because the pollinators themselves, the bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds prefer to be in the sun. And these plants are bee magnets. So we have the California poppy, the sunflower plant, rosy buckwheat, which I mentioned before, salvia, salvia leucophila. Um, out in my in front of my garden, I have hot lip salvia, which is just amazing. The hummingbirds are all over that plant and we'll be getting to hummingbirds in just a few minutes. So these are bee magnets. What's really interesting about um, some of the butterflies and the mission blue is a butterfly on the threatened species list and it predominates in um, San Bruno Mountain, which is just south of San Francisco. And it has to have silverbush lupine or lupinus albifrons for survival. This is the plant that this particular mission blue butterfly uh, will pollinate, it thrives on it. And so, um, but other, you can also grow it in your garden um, because it attracts other butterflies also. But specifically the Mission Blue need this for their very procreation and survival. 
So here's a plant, Monarda digma. And that plant, the reason I like it is it's a three-way plant. It attracts both hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies. All three like it and they will be attracted to it. And mine are just getting little buds now, but I live in San Francisco. I've heard other people that live on the peninsula. Peninsula, their bee balm plant is already blooming, but you know, the te with temperature variations, zone um, variations, depending on where you live, it could, could obviously bloom at different times. So you could see here a bee on one Monarda and let me get my pen out, my arrow. A bee on one plant, butterfly on another, I mean, hummingbird on another, but butterflies also um, use this plant to pollinate and spread pollen from plant to plant. And back to those solitary bees for a minute, the ground nesters. Um, so the, the ground nesters are the bumble, the digger, the miner, and there's also a bee called a sweat bee, which I'm not as familiar with. But um, the ground nesters need exposed soil that drains well on a slope or level ground. So it's really important in your garden to not mulch everything. Don't mulch every spot in your garden to allow um, some habitat for the ground nesters, the digger, the miner, and the sweat. This looks like a piece of bamboo. And if you look in garden catalogs, sometimes you'll see um, bee nests uh, made with bamboo or with, with a lot of numerous little openings. They're kind of interesting. And the groupings back to the clumping grouping. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. Group groupings of single flower species together enables pollinators to spot that plant quickly. You want to make it as easy for them, you know, as possible to get to your garden and do their work. And they have to spend less time and energy. Um, when you have clumpings and plant groupings required for foraging. And this is water for bees. So bees get most of their water from the dew um, on the leaves of the plants. And they also use uh, pooling stations, sprinkler heads and fountains as a source of water. So I guess this would be one thing to think about during the drought that if you primarily use drip irrigation in your garden, um, then where are the bees going to get this dew from, right? Um, so it, my point being that with less rainfall, no rainfall, um, no overhead water, uh, one might want to provide a pooling station for bees so that they can, that's a very shallow saucer set out with some water in it or occasionally water overhead, whatever you can do. I and mean, they do drink water and they need water. So bumblebees and other pollinator, pollinators need three things to thrive. And this includes all three categories I'm talking about today, the bee, the butterfly, and the hummingbird. Flowers on which to forage, a place to build their nest, and a pesticide-free environment. And to learn more, you could go to xerces.org. It's a great website. I'll be showing that again. 
um, on my reference slide at the end of the presentation. And they have all kinds of valuable information um, on pollinators in general, uh, bees, butterflies, etc. So the reason I show this uh, slide, it's a photo, there's a big nursery over in Richmond on the East Bay, California, called Annie's Annuals. And this was actually on the front of one of their catalogs, garden catalogs, uh, last year. And you can order from Annie's, I'm not uh, endorsing any particular nursery, but I'll be mentioning, mentioning a few as I go along that I know sell native plants. And it's quite a trick trek. I know if you live on the peninsula or San Francisco to get out to Point Rich, to, it's beyond Point Richmond, actually. I'm sorry, it's San Pablo. So it's quite a trick to go out there. But for me, it takes an hour each way over the Bay Bridge to get out to the nursery, but it's an incredible nursery and um, on acres and acres of land. But they also, you can order online. And if you order a minimum of so many plants, uh, they will ship them to you and they ship very well. Their plants are, by that I mean the plants are well protected and they come when they say they're going to come. And my, my um, success in dealing with them has, has been good. So. It's a resource to keep in mind because oftentimes people ask, well, where do I get my pollinator plants? Or what's a good source for native plants? So now we're moving into butterflies. There's more than 55 species that are native to the San Francisco Bay Area. Worldwide, there's 20,000 um, species. And in the US, there's 575 species. And here we have 55 that are native uh, to, the, to the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and many of these butterflies are year round. And the Bay Area has the highest density of endangered species in the US. So one person, you, can make a difference. We're gonna launch into this. So what's contributed to the decline of our butterflies is the loss of both open space and native plants um, as well have taken a toll on the butterfly population. And that's um, in addition to the pesticides I mentioned earlier, and uh, development, you know, uh, encroaching upon the open space has really eliminated fields and, and open spaces of, of um, area to grow in the monarch's case, uh, what they need to lay their larvae. So the monarch butterfly is known as Danaus plexippus. And in Greek, that term means sleeping transformation. And that, the next slide will explain that. So here's the monarch life cycle. So it starts with the laying of an egg, which as you can see with the pin on the leaf next to it, is about the size of a pinhead. That's how tiny it is. And then the egg transforms transformation into the larva and the larva uh, forms a chrysalis. And oftentimes these are hanging from branches of trees and can really mimic what looks like a dried leaf. So, just be extra careful when you're removing things, cleaning up, getting rid of debris, that what you're, what you're taking off the branch or putting in the green bin is 
not the chrysalis. You have to really look. And I think as gardeners, we're kind of trained to really look at things. But a reminder is never, it's always good. And then it turns into an adult. And this cycle takes about anywhere from 21 days to about a month to complete and start to end. And then what happens, um, and that would be the first generation or it's called the first star, the one star. There are some additional butterflies. Um, the buckeye, the painted lady, the California sister, and skippers. And these are also, and I don't want to use the term common because all these populations that are declining, but they are um, seen more in the Bay Area than um, the monarchs. The monarch population declined in 2018, and there's there's um, they do counts. In 2018, our monarch population in the Western states was 30,000 monarchs. And as of early this year, early 2021, in the first quarter, the population was 2,000. So that's a 28,000 count reduction in the number of monarchs, which really points to why we have to do uh, whatever we can um, as home gardeners, whatever organ organizations we choose to support, to um, support our pollinators. Here are some caterpillar favorites. And that is the rosy buckwheat again, the checker bloom um, flower, snapdragons, monkey flower or mimulus um, and ceanothus again. So ceanothus, we've seen that twice now, right? Many of these plants ha do have multiple pollinators. The ceanothus we saw, we talked about the bees and ceanothus, and now we're talking about uh, the ceanothus as a caterpillar favorite. The other thing I wanted to mention is the West Coast, um, the Snapdragon family, the Buckeye, let me just go back, the Buckeye butterfly particularly likes the Snapdragon family, the monkey flower and um, particularly likes and the checker uh, spot, like um, members of the thistles, nettles, grasses, oak and willow trees. Some other really um, good favorites are lavatera, hollyhock, and checker bloom for both skippers and West Coast lady butterflies. And the monkey flower or mimulus, this one here, monkey flower or mimulus for the bunkai butterfly and the checker spot butterfly. Okay, so here's some examples of milkweed that are in our area. And this one, so the A stands for Aschlepius tuberosa. Um, it does double duty for monarch, both of these milkweeds, but there are many varieties. Mm -hmm. So it feeds both the caterpillar and the adult. And uh, here's another variety of Aschlepius area carpa. I think this is a very unusual looking plant and it would be beautiful to have in your garden as well as, I mean, both of these are when they're, they're obviously milkweeds in bloom, 
but it would be um, an asset to any garden just to have these for their beauty as well as their function. And then here, here's nectar plants that, um, that butterflies like. And this is the, the Budlia, otherwise known as, um, oops, let me go back here. Butter, Budlia is also known as butterfly bush. And we have the asters, scaviosa, and lantana. So these have uh, lots of nectar and the butterflies go after them. And again, this is not an all-inclusive list. It's just to give you an idea of what some of these plants are and, um, and, and how beautiful they could also be in your pollinator garden. So butterflies need water. So we're going to talk for a minute about puddling stations. And so they need water and they also need minerals. And so they obtain this if from a puddling station. There's a couple of ways to do this actually. So um, a puddling station is created by using a large saucer and putting small pebbles in the bottom of the saucer and then adding some cow manure or horse manure in the saucer and then adding water. And that creates the cow manure and the, or horse manure, whatever you decide to use, um, creates the minerals that the butterfly needs for survival. And so that's one way to do it. Another way to do it, and I just read this yesterday actually. And so, but it's on a reputable, the US Forest Service site is to create a damp salt lick for butterflies and bees. Use a dripping hose, drip irrigation line, um, or place your bird bath on a bare soil I don't know if I would do that because the birds might be vulnerable, but create a damp area in your garden. Mix a small bit of sea salt into the mud and just to allow, obviously this is an area where the mud would, um, would basically congregate and hang and, and stay, in, stay there without draining off or dripping off quickly to supply that. But this is a more surefire way that is tried, true, and tested. The other one I just wanted to mention, if you wanted to explore that more, it's the US Forest Service. And that's all I need to say about that. Um, Butterflies need sunbathing rocks. Again, here's the water and you can see the pebbles around it. Now we'll move on to herbs. Lavender catnip, here's a whole list, chives, fennel, Rosemary yarrow, yarrow, yarrow. Um, the other herbs that butterflies really like are borage and some mints. What else do they like? Warm temperatures and sunshine. They prefer areas uh, sheltered from the wind. And native plants support three times as many species of butterflies than ornamental plants do. And here is a picture of the chrysalis um, photo. Um, you could see where these could be missed if you, you didn't have a sharp eye um, because they kind of blend in 
except the yellow here is distinctive with the branch. Other um, chrysalises from other butterflies can look very leaf-like. This is a good excuse or recommendation not to be too neat in your garden, in your garden because the caterpillars need a place to hide and many overwinter in your yard. So it's recommended actually that you leave some of the old plants, the leaves and the garden debris. This is a tiger swallowtail butterfly on a purple cone flower. And so I show this because Echinacea is also a really good pollinator plant. And here's that mission blue that needs the silver lupine to survive and thrive. And then this is the bay checker spot butterfly who up until like the 30 years ago was prolific in San Francisco and on down through the spine of the peninsula and over to the East Bay. And now it's a, it's been classified as an endangered species. And they're actually doing a project in Fort Mason where they have on um, breeding these che checker spots and transporting them to other areas. Like they took some to San Bruno Mountain. San Bruno Mountain used to be um, full of these. And so did, I looked up a place in um, off of 280 on the peninsula called Evergreen Park. It's right off of 280, but they're doing, um, they're, there's a big movement um, with this butterfly group to bring back, this was original too, and the next slide will show. Um, it was a part of our, the San Francisco Bay Area story. And there was a story done on this in 2017, again in the San Francisco about how the feral they were and the work that they were doing to reestablish the uh, the species known as E. adipa. So the message here is protect our butterflies. They are the flowers of the air. 22 species are now formally listed as threatened or endangered. And next we'll be discussing hummingbirds. This is a beautiful, probably male because it's so colorful, hummingbird in flight. And um, hum is the sound the winds make. Hummingbirds are the smallest birds in the world and they only live in the Americas or the Western hemisphere. I found that really interesting. So, and this is an anise hummingbird. They're common in California year round. They're the greatest consumer of insects of all hummers, the greatest consumer. This is a colorful red-headed, red-throated male, the, the gray, uh, with a little green on the back is the female anise hummingbird and it, cons it consumes three times its weight in insects every day and it sings more than any other hummer. So hum is the sound the wings make. They're the smallest birds in the world And here's three plants that hummingbirds adore. Um, they tend to like plants that have, and if you look at the size of their beak, um, it's very small and it's very narrow, long and needle-like. So they like tubular flowers uh, or trumpet-shaped flowers. 
really appealed to them. And so this is a fuchsia species, a bush manzanita and a scarlet penstemon. And for planting success uh, with hummingbirds, you want to, to choose a variety of plants again for diversity, color, form, and texture. Plant in full to partial sun. Choose plants that bloom in the spring, summer, and fall. Here we go again with the, the three seasons um, required for continuous bloom. And create mounds or clumps adding interest to flat terrain and weave herbs and natives together. So what about hummingbird feeders? There was some controversy about hummingbird feeders a couple of years ago that, that hit a high point. So what do they like to eat? So we're gonna talk about feeders here. So what the feeders provide, and by the way, you can make your own hummingbird solution with one part sugar and four parts water. You do not need to mix it in any food coloring like red dye, in fact, it's bad for them. Um, but if you use a red feeder, that should act as enough of an attractant to lure them to your, uh, to your feeder. They like a mixed diet of pollen from multiple plant sources. So pollens have proteins, which the sugar water does not. And that's why they became a little controversial and then that was sorted out. So what the scientists came to the conclusion was that they can live on sugar water, but probably their longevity. So the longevity of a hummingbird can be up to eight years. So they can live on sugar water, but they, can, they do not survive or thrive to their maximum longevity of eight years. But what the sugar water provides, and, I, and I'm definitely um, encourage that you use a hummingbird feeder in addition um, to your basic draw, which is your plants. Um, so you need a combination of both those pollinator plants and the feeder. Um, the feeder provides mainly, as we know, sugar is a carbohydrate. So that's providing um, some energy, but the, the protein um, provides sustenance because they burn so many, they're hyper metabolizers and they burn so many calories. So this is a very well-fed male hummer in this um, picture. Um, and someone said, when I showed this once at a live presentation, I think he needs a little Weight Watchers, but that's a subject of a different um, domain here. And their favorites are California Fuchsia, uh, Agastache, Rosy Giant, and Coyote Mint, also known as Monardello. And I just wanted to mention, because it's not on a slide before I forget, there is, was an article in the San Francisco Chronicle on Sunday, June 6th in um, the food and wine section. And it was under the title Plant Scout. And the title was Lure Butterflies and Bees with These Colorful Natives. And it talks about coyote mint or, or monardello. Um, and how they're found throughout California and the Bay Area. And it covers like three or four different varieties of this and what would do well in Bay Area, what, which coyote mints would do well in Bay Area gardens. So for those of you, you can go online at SF Gate if you want to pursue that um, further. And of all the coyote mints, Monardella adoratissima, or odor is the most fragrant coyote mint. So remember, it's not just the color, it's the fragrance and the texture and the size of your plantings that attract the pollinators to your garden. So the protein, so hummers eat insects for their protein. 
and um, they can catch these they're amazing little birds in mid-flight and they will eat the insects right out of the spider's web and they use the web for building their nests and attaching it to um, trees and bushes so um, So on your neighborhood flyway, each bird, each hummingbird needs from 400 to 1,000 plants to drink from, to get their nectar. That's a lot of plants. They don't sip. They lick up the ne nectar at a very high rate of speed. And they're, they have incredible visual acuity. It's so sharp. Um, they see everything in the red range of color, but they also see yellows, blues, and oranges. They use this web for building their nests. And in terms of their speed, um, they can pivot and tilt their wings. Their wings rotate at the shoulders and move in a figure eight pattern. And so they can maintain, they're one of the only birds that can maintain long-term hovering over a plant or, or anything that they happen to be flying over, anything that catches their interest. Um, they're agile in the air. They can even fly upside down. Um, they can't walk and the cells in their feathers reflect like a prism. And again, we looks like we have a male on the left and it's hard to tell on the right because that looks, no, and a female on the right, you see the green marking on the back and they're fiercely territorial. They lap up nectar and, and sap with a very long tongue. And they also have the largest brain, heart, energy, and output, the highest in-flight metabolism um, of any bird in proportion to their body size. So they pollinate by passing pollen from one flower to the next, feeding on pollen, pollen and spreading it as they go, and here's our trumpet-shaped flower again. We already talked about them living up to eight years. They can fly at 40 miles per hour for a 500-mile range. But when you hear that buzzing, if you've ever gotten that in, in, when you're out in your garden alongside your ear, they dive bomb at 60 miles per hour. And this is an Allen's hummingbird and nest that actually this photo was taken by David As Asman. He's um, a professional friend of mine. And uh, this was taken at the San Francisco Botanical Garden. And this is a female bird in her nest. Um, oftentimes those spider webs are used. And here she's sitting on her eggs. And I wanted to show you the size of a hummingbird nest. So they're about one inch in diameter. And typically a hummingbird lays two eggs, no more than two eggs, um, and no less. It's, it's very, it's, it's, it's a trait. So, and you can see the size of those eggs are very small to fit in this one inch diameter uh, nest. They go for maximum comfort. They try to protect their chicks with maximum comfort. So in many uh, nests, you'll find spider silk, uh, plant down, moss, feathers, pieces of leaves, um, lichens, and spider web. And as the chicks grow and move around, the nest is able to expand thanks to the elasticity and strength of the cobwebs that bind the nest material together. Um, 
Willow trees also provide nest materials. Uh, flowers provide nectar and attract the insects. They have one or two broods a year of two white eggs. And the incubation is two weeks um, for nestlings and three to four weeks overall, usually before they make their first attempt at flying the nest. So our four basic wildlife needs are um, for any garden are food, water, cover, and space. And this is a photograph of my garden and in front of it, you can see it's a bit overgrown here. Um, these are the hot lip salvias I mentioned. And it's basically the front of it is pretty much filled uh, with salvias. Behind this salvia, I also have a pineapple sage, which is attractant uh, to pollinators. Roses, by the way, I mentioned those earlier off in the presentation, rosacea family. Um, the pollinators like the roses in, in May. Some of my roses, I have maybe four in this section and the rest are all sages. Um, they are, were really going for my Sally Holmes rose. And these are two other plants I have towards the back of my garden, uh, Cestrum elegans or Smithy, which is the pink variety. And again, you see the tubular shaped blossoms. And this plant um, can grow quite tall. I keep mine maintained about six feet, seven feet tall, and it's loaded with blossoms right now. And then another plant that I have is Ver Verbena lilacina, which you can see, right? I was able to capture this photo. It's not as good as some of those other photos, but I did my best um, with it looks like a swallowtail but butterfly on it. So I encourage you to start or expand your pollen, pollinator habitat this month, the month of June. And you can start with a smaller patch, or if you already have a, a pollinator garden started, now would be a good time to expand it. And you can continue expanding it over time. So you could do this by incorporating a succession of flowers to provide blooms throughout the season and include those different flower species that we talked about and uh, be sure to incorporate native plants as your preferred plant. And then observe the four W's, which is wait, watch, water, and weed. And you'll be doing that um, because it may take some time, you wanna keep your garden healthy and it may take some time, but eventually you will see with some patients, pollinators enjoying your garden. And um, I wish you all the best of luck with your pollinator garden. And thank you for attending the presentation. And just by improving your knowledge of pollinators and taking that first step to plant um, somebody I know in a workshop took their first step by planting three containers um, of the same species of plant to start hers. So thank you for making a difference for the butterflies, bees, and other pollinators. And if you need to, you can look at this attending this workshop as a preliminary step um, on the journey. On San Bruno Mountain, we have a picture of, in closing, volunteers planting nectar plants. And remember, this was the home of the Mission Blue butterfly and also where silver um, lupine and a lot of other, uh, like monkey flower, a lot of other natives grow up there. It's an amazing mountain to, watch, to walk on if you're, uh, in the San Francisco area, it's easily accessible off of 101. 
And um, it's just an amazing place with all kinds of wildflowers in the spring. Here's some programs that promote wildlife enhancements. We have uh, the Backyard Wildlife Habitat Program, and it, it has a lot of resources and um, one can get certified as a Backyard Wildlife Habitat if one would like to do that. And there's also a Butterfly Garden Certification Program. I'd like to acknowledge Lingso Garden uh, Materials um, for hosting this presentation today. And I have an acknowledgement of many of the photographers who contributed to this presentation. And I would also like to thank uh, another fellow master gardener, Pat Sanford, for contributing um, some slides of hers to this presentation. Here's some other references for you. Uh, UC Davis, uh, the Pollinator Partnership, pollinator.org, Xerces I already mentioned, it's a great pollinator resource center. Um, our bees are in trouble too, you know, and so uh, they provide a lot of, not just gardening material, but, but, but also material like addressing it from an ecological point of view, what's necessary legislative wise, um, what I found out in the process that a lot of um, these, some of these species are, are classified as endangered or threatened, but unless significant area is allocated um, for their use, uh, that development, uh, pesticides, everything can encroach upon it. So it, it's not just receiving a, uh, a species designation, but it's having the accompanying legislation about how much area needs to be protected around it. There's some other references. Native plant nurseries. Okay, right in San Francisco, we have a plant nursery called Bay Natives, which sells the narrow leaf, um, the Asclepias narrow leaf uh, plant that is the milkweed native to our area. And they, they sell it there. Um, Las Colitas I've mentioned, and you'll find, I guess the, the, my major tip here is to say, if you live in another area, um, check your nurseries for which have native plants. And also to check with the nursery about um, which are native, not native to your area and which are the preferred pollinators. You can gain a lot of information from local nurseries. And um, it's important to use that resource, I think. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that when you're buying, speaking of nurseries, when you're buying, um, pollinator plants. It's best to buy the old fashioned variety and not the, um, the cultivars because oftentimes like the cultivars have been hybridized so that the ability of that plant. So an example would be a zinnia plant. Like there's the old fashioned zinnia with like one row of leaves around the center and the cultivars have like like double petals, double, double this, double that. And you want to avoid that because oftentimes the, the um, pollen and nectar have, have been diluted in, in the cultivation process from, the, from, that, from those particular plants. So it's not going to provide the nectar and pollen that your pollinators need. So, um, stick to the old fashioned variety of flowers and really investigate if it's a cultivar or if it's been hybridized as to how that's affected the plant. Just a little tip. Oh, and the other thing I learned is that at Home Depot, um, I went there for some 
home supplies and I wandered into the nursery in Colma and their plants now have a label, many of them that say disease resistant, treated with, um, treated with uh, neck, neck, I'm not sure how to say this term, um, neonec neonectinoids, treated with neonectinoids. And so when you see that, also it's not just you applying pesticides, but it's what's been done to the plant before you buy it. So if you see any of those labels and you will see them and you're particularly going after this plant for a to use as a pollinator plant, I would pass on it. Just a tip, take it or leave it. And here are some Facebook groups. We have Pollinator Power, Simply Swallowtails. Um, I've been on Simply Swallowtails. They have some great information, beautiful photos. Uh, Hummingbirds Anonymous and California Butterfly Lady. So I'll leave this up for a minute just in case anyone would like to jot those down. And um, And lastly, if you have questions, you know, you can ask a master gardener. That's what we're there for. And you can call our helpline. The number's on this last page. It will be in the presentation that you receive um, by PDF. You can also email questions to us um, by including all of your information. And pictures always help. So when you have a question, describe the problem and insert as many photos as needed. Like if it's an infestation and it's just on the underside of the leaves, but it may also be on the stem. It may be on the trunk of the plant. So uh, insert as many photos as you need. And right now our helplines, so our helplines are operational like everything else. Uh, we have not come back fully, so we don't have these open hours but you can still reach our helpline offices and uh, by calling the main number. And we're happy to answer your questions. Be advised that sometimes they do take um, a, someone will get back to you in a, in a timely fashion, but that timely fashion could be a few days, it might be a week, but somebody is looking into and investigating um, your questions so that they're giving you the right answers, whether it's plant ID or plant disease. So I will leave this up on the screen for a little bit. And I guess I'll turn it over to you, Ken, um, to see what questions we have. Well, thank you, Aridi. That was a fantastic class and talk, lots of information. So we've got a couple questions. Okay. Um, let, I'm going to start from the beginning of the talk here. So um, this is sort of an advice from, yeah, this person is concerned about drift, pesticide drift from neighbors and such. What's the best way to address that? I know uh, personally talking to the neighbors <laughs> always helps. So wanted to hear from you on your take about how to reduce the pesticide use in your neighborhood. Well, you, one could get very active and start a neighborhood uh, group. But I think, Can, what you mentioned, talking one-on-one -on -one is always the most helpful approach. If you know who it is, you know, I mean, the, the wind and the direction that the wind is blowing, um, what, just be careful that you've tracked it enough to know which property it's coming from. And then I would ask to talk with the neighbor and um, ask them if they simply uh, must, you know, that you are growing a pollinator garden and you understand that they may have different needs, but if they absolutely uh, must spray to do it on a day that's not windy um, and to preferably do it in the evening hours when the pollinators aren't out and um, when they're inactive, as I said earlier. 
So that may be the extent realistically that you can control someone else's actions. Um, but if you wanted to get involved and active, you could perhaps find some like-minded people on your block and bring them um, together and maybe start a little group. You know, I don't know if this is one neighbor or more neighbors where, um, you know, you could involve other neighbors in it and um, maybe have a, I, one could get creative here, you know, uh, you could have now that we can meet in groups again, outside, you might have a little open house and introduce your neighbors to your pollinator garden. So there's nothing like seeing something that kind of brings home to people. Oh, and, and at this informal group, um, you could somehow weave into the conversation that all of your pollinator plants are the importance of them having an environment that's pesticide free. And so you could take it to whatever level um, you want. And I'm open to other people, if other people in the audience would like to contribute something to that. That's fantastic. Thanks, Aridi. Um, so on the same lines of the pesticide use, I know Neem is uh, sort of a uh, biocontrol for a lot of the pest management and it's considered safe, but what is your take on using neem oil or neem sprays? Um, would that affect the bee population or the butterflies? Or could you give us a, a, your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, neem is, it's controversial with pollinators in that it's generally not recommended. Now, again, as my slide indicated, and that's for all the pollinators, really. Bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Now, if uh, you absolutely, using the integrated pest management way of approach, have to use something, um, again, observing the rules of uh, sort of the principles of when you spray, how often you spray, is there something else you could try before you get to the neem, like insecticidal soap, a blast of water from the hose um, in a consistent way, three times a week? Um, is that particular plant worth, that you're trying to save, is it worth jeopardizing your pollinator garden for? There's a whole series of questions that one could ask oneself in, deter in determining um, what to use. But generally with pollinator plants, um, it's not recommended that, and, and I, I know what neem is and I'm aware of it and I've used it before, uh, but not in a while. And um, there's no judgment here. It's just how clean you wanna keep your garden and how protected you wanna keep your pollinator plants. Okay, fair enough. So let's move on to another question here. Um, how concerned, if at all, should we be about the Africanized bees? I know some of the uh, hornet, like Asian giant hornets will kill our native bees. Um, not sure how many locations they've been detected here in the West and South and the Pacific, but should we be concerned about the Africanized bees jeopardizing our native population here? Well, that question I may need to do a little bit more research on and get back to CAN with a link to, I know that, that it's an issue um, with the Africanized bees and their aggressiveness. And, um, but I don't know if how significantly they reduce the native population. I know that um, there's so many factors like colony collapse with bees. You know, when you look at the main factors for the bees uh, decline, they, ne they mentioned colony collapse. There's a viral, uh, there's a viral disease. Um, there is insecticide use. Those are sort of the three top things and, and lack of, um, 
lack of open space, like development that are commonly mentioned. So it's a good question and I will get back to CAN um, with a link that perhaps specifically addresses um, the African bee. Okay, thanks, Rady. Um, so this next question, uh, I'm just gonna read this to you. This person has a fairly large area of milkweed, but have yet to see any eggs or caterpillars on them. Is there something else that they need to do to attract the monarchs? And their gardens full of pollinator plants that you've mentioned and, and is 95% native. Oh, well, very good. The last part's um, excellent. Um, the milkweed, oftentimes it doesn't sound like it was newly planted, but if it's newly planted, it oftentimes will not bloom until the second year. And that was the weight, well, water, weight, the four W's, um, that it requires like a season, another, another year round season before it blooms. If it doesn't fall in that camp and it's not blooming, you might look at the species that you have. Like, um, is that suitable for our area? Because there's very different varieties of milkweed. Like I showed two slides, A speciosa and uh, there's the narrow leaf uh, milk, milkweed, but is it, uh, do we have the right plant in the right place? Is it getting sun? Because all pollinated plants, they, not, they want full sun and, um, or partial sun, which means at least four hours, four to six hours a day of sun. Now there are some that, that are exceptions always, like the cestrum that I showed you in my garden, that's in part sun, part shade, and it, it blooms and it attracts hummingbirds, but it's all different. So is it, is it in the right location to bloom? Is it getting enough sun, the species, um, and the species for your area? I think those are two critical things and the length of time planted. So I would look at all three of those um, and then uh, it may require that you move the milkweed. By the way, fall is a good time to start milkweed from seed. Um, now it's a bit too late. So it may require that you, fall, you, you grow a new patch, a different species somewhere else. But be open to change uh, if it's been beyond two years. And you might just let, let it as a scientific ex experiment wait and grow another patch somewhere else and see what happens next year. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I guess it's a showy milkweed and a narrow leaf milkweed and it is blooming and it's in the full sun. It is blooming. Yes. I thought the question was it wasn't blooming, Ken. Oh, it's, it, it, they're not getting caterpillars on the- oh, They're not getting caterpillars. I'm right. sorry. They're I'm not seeing that. any eggs or caterpillars on them and they're wondering how to attract the monarchs. Yeah, well, it sounds like you have the right species, the right environment, and um, and so why aren't you getting caterpillars on those? I don't know. Well, that may have to do something with you know this year's Xerxes report, the the huge well, the, drop in the monarch population this true. year. You know, well, yeah, that. from thirty thousand to to uh, to two thousand. Correct. Exactly. So they're right. not returning back. Um, so there just aren't back. any. I know in Monterey, the monarchs, I mean, Pacific Grove, which is like the monarch capital of the world, it's called. You know, they had, they usually have uh, photos of monarchs dripping and hanging off their trees. And this year there were none. So the, the population definitely, it's very um, good, could be contributing. But I was gathering from the question and why I didn't land on that was that this isn't just a problem this year. I mean, maybe the person could put in the chat if this has been a problem since it was planted or is this just a problem this year, the last two years? That would be helpful. Yeah. 
We'll wait for that to come in. Yeah. So, Thank you, Kim. Um, do you know any um, local programs to propagate um, monarch eggs and caterpillars? I don't. Oh, we got an answer. So they've had the, the milkweed for about five years. And so I, I'm gathering it's been a problem beyond this year. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's what I thought somehow. So Maybe I'm um, just thinking it's location based almost too. Maybe it's not. Yeah, which is why I mentioned um, the sun and, and, um, but the species and everything else and the length of time match. So I can only think of location then uh, yeah. at this point and may maybe try another patch of a different um, species somewhere else and just conduct your own lab experience. Yeah. Alrighty. So I think we have just one more question and we'll, we'll sign off here soon. Um, so I think this actually from the same person, um, the native verbena seem to thrive when they first put it in and then they just sort of die after a year or two. Um, do you know why that is? <laughs> <laughs> That's a question for the master gardener. Send, in your, right. send in your photos. <laughs> send yeah. in your, your photo of this uh, verbena, as many as you need, and email that question to the master gardeners and um, uh, and the see what their line. suggestion is. See what their suggest because at the helpline you have all kinds of other master gardeners and, and a director at times to rely on, and they'll really research it for you, you know, before they reply. So I still have my last slide up in the presentation. So take advantage of that and send that question on in. And what was the, going back to that, uh, the, the question before that one, Ken, what the local, it, the same is true of that question, right? So oh, it's just any local programs to propagate um, monarch eggs and caterpillars. Um, you know that monarch, there's a monarch um, Facebook. If you Google, there's a Facebook group. I think it's called Beautiful Monarchs beautiful monarchs go on that group because anything or check it out at least because anything like that um, that's happening um, locally or in terms of resources the, the group is fantastic for that and they just focus on the their attention is just on the monarch butterfly so I would check it out there and but I do not know in San Francisco. Um, if anyone else in the group knows of such a program, you could put it in the chat and we could share that. Um, but again, a question for the master gardeners or a um, checking out Facebook group uh, devoted to monarchs. Oh. Well, thank you so much, Rady. I know there's a, a plethora of resources that you shared with us today and um, <laughs> really helpful. And I will be emailing a copy of the PDF to everybody. So everyone will have those resources. And again, this will be uploaded on our website so you can watch it later as well. But um, again, wanna thank you uh, for a wonderful class and thank everybody in attendance. So any closing words, Rady? You're you're welcome to share that. Get out and get in your gardens. <laughs> and now's a good time uh, to actually add some plants to your existing pollinator garden or um, to start afresh and with a new garden if you haven't already. And I wish you all well uh, because it will bring you, from my own personal experience, um, just beautiful moments of enjoyment. You know, when I see the, the, there's a flyway here in my neighborhood of the hummingbirds. And when I see them um, hovering over my hot lips salvia, it just brings joy to my heart. You know, it's something beautiful and natural to look at. And the same when I captured that butterfly um, on my verbena, uh, Illicina. It, it's uh, just a wonderful feeling. So, um, and you're helping the planet, right? We're all helping the planet um, 
to encourage these species. So uh, that can also make you feel good on a broader sense. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you. That was beautifully said. So thank you everyone for attending and uh, we'll see you on another class. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye.